Hey, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. We've got another great Sales Hacker webinar for you today. So I'm your host. I'm Colin Campbell. I'm the Director of Marketing at Sales Hacker. And today, I'm pumped because we're talking about selling to the C-suite, selling to executives. Like, how do you get their attention and keep their attention? Do you have to prepare differently when you're presenting to them? When you're doing the presentation, what do you do differently? They see a lot of presentations. How do you stand out? all of these things. And what's so great about today is the advice on this topic is coming from the C-suite. So I'm joined by Keith Messick. He's the CMO at Dialpad. Keith, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Psyched to be here uh, with you. And uh, for those of you who don't know Dialpad, uh, I guess the way I would describe it, Keith, is like a business communications platform. It's got conferencing and a dialer and a phone system. Am I describing that right? Yeah, I keep going. I like it. It's perfect, for, it's perfect for modern sales teams. Make sales yeah. any device, your cell phone, your laptop, your desk phone, sync to Salesforce. Um, there's a lot of magic there. A lot of magic. Um, and you get sold to a lot. So I'm really, really excited to hear your tips back for salespeople about how they should try to sell to you and other people like you. Before we dive in, though, I have two quick things just for everybody uh, who's joining. And there is a lot of you. Thanks for coming on. First of all, um, right now, go ahead down to the bottom in the Q&A feature. Click at the bottom of your Zoom window, click Q&A. And if you want to intro yourself, do that. If you want to make sure you, you have an answer, like email or phone or call their cell phone, go ahead and ask your question now. I'll try to make sure it gets answered. Um, and if you just want to intro yourself, go ahead and do that. But kind of what I really want to know is what's one word that you would use to describe your worst sales meeting? If you've had a bad moment, what's the word that you would use to describe it? <laughs> I mean, for, I've had some bad ones. Mine would just be cringe. Like I look back, it's four years later and I still dream about it. Unprepared, yeah, we got Dennis Bedford said cringy too. David Mammon says disjointed. Oh, somebody, this is a good one. Matt Holden said one-sided, Keith. What do you think about that? Very good. I can see how that would go bad. By the way, I fully expect, I, I, I hear there's a rumor that we have seven, 800 people on this. And if at least a quarter of the comments aren't just to make fun of marketing, then I'm going to be really disappointed. <laughs> oh, bring me the best. Uh, somebody said over talking to Cameron Mark said, oh, Benjamin Roach says Pompeii disaster. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. So, to bring him in so we can understand what happened. Yeah, we're going to want to hear that story, Benjamin. Uh, all right, thanks for introducing yourselves, everybody, and sharing your feelings on bad sales meetings. Hopefully, we can get you walking away with some actionable tips today. For those of you um, who feel like you're pretty good at this, just know that Keith's starting from some of the fundamentals. So if you feel like you have a handle on his first two or three tips, Hang in there because we're getting, like you have to master the fundamentals. That's your table stakes. And we're getting more advanced towards the end. Um, the other thing I just want to note before we dive in is that we're recording this. So if you have to step away, don't worry about it. Or if you just want to review it later or share with colleagues, we'll send you the recording later. Um, all right, Keith, a couple rapid fire questions for you, if I may. On average, in a given day, how many messages, cold messages in email and LinkedIn messages would you say that you receive? Um, no fewer than 50 a day. And depending on the day of the week, as many as 75, 80. Okay, wow. So 50 to 80 cold messages a day. Uh, how many phone calls are you receiving a day? I try to keep that to a minimum. So, um, but I get, I get quite a few I don't, my number is a little hard to get intentionally because of that, but I get another probably 10 to 15 a day. Okay. That's still a lot, even with a hard to get number. And by the way, that the, I think a thing just right out of the gates is that's just people trying to sell me as the CMO. I also get another hundred emails as a consumer of someone yeah. trying to sell me. And, you know, I get people calling me about life insurance. So it's, it, the thing that I think B2B sellers have to appreciate is that they're fighting for attention with everyone. It's not just like I segment my life into consumer and business. It, attention's attention. Yeah. Executives are people too, guys. Uh, 
and they're busy, especially busy. But here's so how does that shake out for salespeople? Like how many in a given month, how many meetings do you end up taking? Um, so I usually try and take meetings. I actually, what works for me is when people bubble up to like my direct reports and, um, I'll give a good example is, um, ad quick. If anyone from ad quicks on the call, nice job. Um, we did some out of home advertising recently and they were quick to reach out with like, Hey, like we have a really interesting platform for taking this nationwide. The, the value prop was both relevant and timely they went to all of, they went to me and my direct reports and we've taken a meeting. So that was a really good real time example that just happened last week and they followed up really well and I'm interested, right? So part of it is just like finding the hook and the perfect timing. Um, but we take, you know, I, I take fewer than five a month for sure. <laughs> okay. So we're talking like uh, total, maybe it's, well, you said 80 a day. So we're talking like 1600 messages and cold calls right. a month you yeah. get five meetings maybe and then how often do you actually buy something um it depends on what it is i mean um a lot of times so one of the things with with c-level executives is that you know the more senior you get usually the bigger your network gets and so a lot of times when i'm looking for something like hey like i reach out to my other friends and marketing so like who do you use for abm so a lot of times yeah. i'll initiate it that way um, but it depends. I mean, we, we buy as things have been identified to or needed, you know, so, um, we, you know, we bought a chat solution recently. I'm interested in this ad quick thing. Um, yeah, so it's, but it's not that much. <laughs> if you're right. trying to get to these small numbers, you're there. Right. Right. Okay. All right. So just trying to paint a picture of what your life is like, and we're going to get into this some more. But one of the things that struck me when we started talking about this first was that, like, it, we all know selling requires empathy. And empathy, you have to have some understanding of what it's actually like to be your buyer at some level, whether it's by having actually been in their shoes or talking to them about it. And I think that's one of the tricky things about selling to executives. Not a lot of people really know what, it li what it's like. Um, all right. So... Let's get right into it then, because I think we want to knock out some of the fundamentals here. Like I said, there's some table stakes to presenting to, to anybody that seem to kind of matter more when you're presenting to executives. Is that fair to say, Keith? Yeah, I think, I think there's this notion that like, for, first of all, if you're not really good at sort of the basics of presenting, you're going to be especially bad, I think, in your executive level presentation. So I started with some like quick and dirty basics just to like sort of give the foundation and then at the end, it's like, hey, here's two or three things that I think are sort of unique potentially to executive level conversations. But like those things don't matter if you don't feel really good about the, the basics. So that was the way I structured this deck. And I'm uh, jump right in if you want. Yeah. In fact, let's. Uh, so if you've been to a Sales Hacker webinar before, audience members, you know we like to keep it interactive. So seriously, put your questions in the Q&A thing. And right now I'd like to poll you you guys, how do you prepare for pre sales presentations today? You'll see a poll pop up in just a second. I want to get a sense of, and be honest, this is a no judgment zone. We're not fooling anybody. Uh, and you don't have to lie. We'll, we'll keep it here. I'll go ahead and answer. Yeah, let me know how that goes and I'll give you some tips for um, <laughs> how to solve that. All right, so we're going to close the poll in three, two, one, and we'll see the results pop up here. Well, it's a pretty good spread. Nice. We got some people winging it. Thanks for being honest. That's right. We all do it sometimes. Hey, good yep. amount of people practicing, though. I love that. That's actually my, my first tip is going to be around confidence and how you get it. So, um, those 31% of the people, you can go get coffee and come back in two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Give yourself a pat on the back for a minute, and Keith's going to share uh, with the rest of the class <laughs> some, some of the fundamentals. Okay. So now we know where we're starting from. Let's jump into it, Keith. Yep. So we'll make that. Hold on. There we go. All right. So just starting with the basics, um, you know, I, I really can't stress this enough. And honestly, like if you were just going to stay for one slide, 
because I'm just going to reference some this <laughs> theme of this one slide a thousand times over the next hour is the most effective presentation is the one you give confidently. Like it's a, it's not content. I mean, all of these things matter, but you can have an amazing, you can have amazing content and amazing stories and amazing design and everything can be set up. But like at the end of the day, the person really is judging the presenter first. And if the, and I've been, I, I will tell you, like I actually was just recently in one of the worst sales presentations that I've ever witnessed that was a company pitching us and this company's like about to IPO and I will not mention them, but I was really shocked at how bad it was. And I was and what it came down to is the person presenting just was, I, I had no confidence in them. So hard to have a lot of confidence in their solution. Um, so a quick, like I won't walk you through the study behind this, but science, oddly enough, um, being confident actually is better than being right especially when the stakes aren't deaf, as you would imagine. So you can Google this. It's pretty interesting, I found. Um, but in terms of, oh, let me get back there. So, you know, I think, how do, how do I get more confident? You know, re rehearse alone, but not too much. I think there is, you can over, um, you can over rehearse something. And then what happens is that you're not prepared for when it goes off track. So yeah. like, note memorization is not super helpful in my mind. And I've never found a really good presenter who just can just who's just regurgitating something because presentations never go the way you planned. I think gut check from a friend, super helpful. So congratulations to those 31%. Um, time yourself. So I think there is this some idea of like, hey, like if everything just stuck to plan, like how long does this take? Does that fit in the amount of time that I want? Um, a good sort of thing is a minute and a half per content slide. That's a good way of thinking about it. I think less is more as a general rule. We all agree. And I really think the thing that I would stress is if you can't tell the story without the slides or the visual aids, and I don't think you can tell the story. So you need to practice with and without, because again, you just have to be prepared for the unexpected. And a lot of times people just don't want to stare at slides. So, so this idea of like rehearsing, but not too much. How yep. do you know when you've hit that point where it starts to turn the other way on you? I think you pressure test it. I think the question is how comfortable are you in the moment when it's not going the way you had planned? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and oftentimes what I find is that like, if you're just like, it, we'll talk about this in a second, but there, there was a, there was a crazy amount. There's a crazy piece of research that, that was given to presenters. Like, and so we'll just say presenters in general, but sales presenters. And it's like, what is, what does a successful presentation look like? And the overwhelming answer of like what success means is that I made it through my slides, which is insane. Like that, that's uh, oh. right. That's insane. So making it through your slides is not the goal of a presentation. The goal of the presentation is to communicate something. Um, and so if you're stressed out, so I would honestly tell you, usually when you make it through your slides, that means it wasn't interactive enough. And oftentimes it just means that you're not actually connecting with the people yeah. on the other side. That's, that's something you should be weary of. So um, that's usually when you know is when, if it goes sideways, if you're freaking out, you're probably over prepared for it to go the straight line. So, so speaking of uh, interacting with people on the other side, Elin Hammondfors uh, is a BDM for a SaaS business in London. And for their, the, the way they described their worst sales meeting was too salesy. And so thanks for that, Elon. I'm wondering, where's the line between confidence and being salesy, right? Because to Elon, maybe being like overconfident is, is a problem. Right. I don't know. What do you think? I think it comes, listen, the, if I'm sitting in a room with you or on the phone, like my expectation is you're the expert. So like if you're not the expert on the thing that you're talking to me about, that, that gives me great pause, right? So I would prefer you to, like there's a difference between confident, but I think they're related, right? I mean, the more you know about something, the more inherently confident you're going to be. I think where salesy, where it gets really salesy is when you just have like really obvious, like presumptive closes. Mm -hmm. And like you, when you just sort of like lose the thread of like this conversation and it becomes into the, it comes into like the, the sort of hard close 
Like for me, that doesn't work. And I question whether that even works anymore in 2019. I just feel like people buy differently. Yeah. So that's what I think of too salesy is just when it's just like aggressive, like I'm not getting, I'm not part of the conversation. It's just me listening to someone bark at me. I hate that. So. Okay. All right. So tip number one, be confident and you can grow confidence with the right kinds of practice and preparation. And so tell us about the airport test then. Yeah. So this is, I think Nancy Duarte came up with this and I want to give her proper credit. She's a very famous presentation designer, but the, um, the airport test is this, is if you printed your deck and you dropped it at the airport and if someone picked it up and it made complete sense, then it's probably a report and it's not a presentation because presentations require presenters and reports don't. And so what happens is, and, and, and it, what happens is, is that when you present a report, you typically lose your audience in a hurry and you end up in a scenario where the presenter isn't adding anything. And it's like, can I just read this please? Like, and so that's the, that's the question. And so I think that where this fall is like the presentation and the leave behind I think those two things are often different. And, and just think about a data sheet versus a presentation, a two pager versus a deck. A two pager require, if it requires explanation, then fire your product marketing team because something's gone horribly wrong. It's meant to be self-explanatory, but the presentation is meant to be presented. So um, when you start looking at your materials, start asking yourself like, does it make perfect sense without me and if it does, I might be, I might err too far on the report side of the house. And that's a general rule, depending on the presentation sometimes. But I mean, just if, it, if you didn't add a lot of value to it, then you probably just gave someone a report. Um, and I also think that like, if you say the same thing each time, you're sort of doing it wrong. It's not really understanding the audience. It's not understanding the personalities in the room, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, presentations in general give you a lot of room to customize. Yeah, I used to have a uh, a manager who would coach me to include more detail in my presentations because the the thought was okay, so your contact is going to pass this on throughout the company, and you want those people to be able to understand it just by looking at it. And it always kind of bugged me, and I never could put words into it until I heard you describe it. The reason it bugged me is because I wasn't there to present it. So why am I presenting it in the first place? That you know, maybe the better practice would be to present something, have the conversation, and then use my notes from that conversation to like annotate my deck or create a second takeaway that can then be shared and passed around. That's correct. Totally agree. By the way, Keith, uh, Giuliano, thanks for calling us out, Giuliano, said uh, sometimes they can't hear you well. Um, okay. Do you have a headset? I do have a headset. Now you're about to hear me really well. Um, that's either going to be a blessing or a curse. <laughs> thanks thanks for right. saying that Juliana you sound right, up better let us know anybody if you can't hear Keith now I hear him great I feel like we're playing Fortnite it's great Tina says it's better all right thanks Tina thanks Tina all right so um, I will move on to number three hey looks weird when you just see it written but it's an important question um, as it relates to understanding the audience. And so depending on what you're selling, it depends on what the, like, especially if you're on the phone or even live, this isn't about what you're literally wearing, just to be clear. It's about like, if you're selling something technical, are they expecting someone who's presenting to be wearing a lab coat, like in their mind? Like, are you, is it going to be speeds and feeds? Is it really technical? Is it meant to be like, hey, like I want someone that, is more like understands our audience. So, you know, venture back companies or we're a nonprofit. I want to know someone that really understands the nonprofit business. And so a lot of times what I find in an unsuccessful presentation is that the voice and tone of the presenter isn't aligned with the expectation of the audience, right? So the expect the audience was expecting someone a lot more technical because they thought we were talking about a tech, you know, the meeting was set up to talk about the technical um, specs of this particular solution. And then the salesperson shows up with a much higher level presentation. So um, what I would say, or just the opposite, like they were thinking this is a business conversation and the person shows up wanting to talk about really like hardcore details around products or whatever it may be. 
So I think a part of this is just knowing your audience and knowing yourself and never hesitate to bring someone in who it, specifically, if you know that a meeting is set up around an area that you're incapable of delivering, you do yourself no favors. This goes back to the confidence thing. You're not going to be confident if they're wanting someone to wear a lab coat and you're not a lab coat type of person. So um, I highly recommend you sort of think ahead of time every time, like do what is the audience thinking? What are they thinking is going to happen here? And I might meet such that. a, this is such a great way to like subjectively set expectations because we talk about expectation setting in meetings and it's like, you know, agenda, um, goals of the meeting, things like that. I love this for like kind of setting it for yourself, setting how you want to be perceived. So I'm sure there's some people listening who, you know, who know that they're presenting themselves with the right tone or right level of formality. There are some people who may right now be realizing, hmm, maybe I need to adjust that. But what if, for the people who are listening who like just don't know, they're wondering now, I wonder if I'm setting the right tone, if I'm presenting myself correctly for the level of audience, what they expect. How do you, how do you know? So I think this comes in with like role playing. I think sales enablement can play a really important part of this. Mm -hmm. um, product marketing can play a really important part of this of trying to under, like, do you understand the audience well enough? A lot of times, especially in sales, if you're high velocity, you're doing a lot of outbound, you're setting up a lot of meetings, you're a rep on the other side, getting these sort of first call meetings without a lot of contacts. Um, you're really, in a weird way, you're, it's sort of like your, your job, you're almost not incented to know because you're, you're right. just playing volume, 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 volume. So it's really good, I think, to either have someone from product marketing start jumping in on some of your calls and, and make sure that you feel like it's appropriate. Because um, a lot of times the audience won't tell you. you know, right, and right. you're just doing your thing, right? And that's a hard job and you're doing it for the 50th time this month. And so a lot of times it's really hard to edit your own writing. Sort of, yeah. it's, it's, so you just ask someone to come in and say how, you know, and be open to critical feedback, I think is probably the most important thing. But find someone you trust in the org and have them, you know, maybe it's not your boss because you don't want them, but find that person, you know, in product marketing or the SE that you've become friends with and have them just listen in and, and give you some feedback. So as an executive, uh, Marty Berman shared this idea. So what about bringing along like a sales engineer or like a teammate who can be the lab coat guy? Well, if I'm the sales guy, I can build a relationship and just focus on the business conversation. If, if, I'm pitching you, an executive. How do you then perceive us if we have we're bringing two people to the meeting to play those roles? Well, in an upcoming slide, I'm going to tell you why that's such a good idea. Um, as a general rule, no one wants to hear, like, this works. We can sustain this for a decent amount of time because Colin and I are having a conversation. But if I just showed up and I was just speaking to the abyss for an hour. Like people, they'll just start bailing, right? So having multiple voices is a really important part of any presentation. You're not giving a TED talk. You know what I mean? Like the people didn't pay yeah. to attend. You're not on stage. So breaking it up and how, and I would say part of the thing that I think salespeople do wrong is they just say like, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk. And then my SE is going to demo. And, and if that talk goes over 10, 15 minutes, by the time the demo happens, everyone's just like, oh, thank God. Like, just, I'm, I'm sick of hearing this person talk. And it's no offense to you. You're probably a great presenter. Just people don't like to sit and listen for, you know, 10, 15 minutes. So you're better to have your SE involved early or whoever it is and really start to, like, bounce content around between uh, the team. You'll keep everyone engaged. I mean, part of this is just the challenge of, like, I have... I have a party that's somewhat interested, maybe, because they're here. We're not sure the premise of which we got them here. Hopefully, it's the right one. And I'm, a, I'm an okay presenter. Now, how do I just keep this person engaged or these people engaged long enough to prove a point? That's yeah. essentially the hack there. Right, okay. Uh, I don't want to spoil it. I yep. think I know the tip you're talking about that comes yep. up that talks more about that. All right, I'm going to blast through these, um, these next two because they're sort of grouped and... And if I had to say, what are, what are the two things that I think I see the most that are just painful in sales presentations is one, it's the assumption that the audience knows. So it's, and I can't tell you how many times 
And uh, even I don't want to say it happens in Dialpad, but it happens at Dialpad. It's well-intentioned. Is you're in a presentation and 10 minutes in, someone in the room says, wait, hey, hold on a second. What, what do you guys do again? Like I, I'm, I'm a little, and the assumption is just that like my BDR set up a me again, you, you never really know. And then in like a third meeting, they've brought, you just assume that your champion has really briefed people on what they're supposed to be listening for. And they don't just do the check of like, Hey, like it doesn't make sense to just spend a few minutes on going over our dial pad or going over sales hack or whatever it may be. Um, you can never ask that question enough because there's really no downside to making sure everyone in the room knows. Uh, and it's, you know, my shameless plug is are the, the, the product we just launched Alpod sell. Actually, it has a guided selling feature we call live coach, which is actually meant to try and help make sure that people in real time are asking the right questions. And one of those questions is around like making sure that someone knows. Right. Um, so the other thing I would say it, so one is like, do they know? And then the other assumption is that they actually care. Um, this one's more painful in the moment. And the challenge here is like, is there an agreed upon problem? Right? So if you, and it, you know, if you, again, you, a lot of times you end up in meetings or second meetings or third meetings, you're not exactly sure who's been brief. So it's okay. Okay. Well, they know, but then do they actually care? Does this person sitting across from me think that this is a problem worth solving? And so in the same way that you're trying to confirm that people understand that, you know, dial pad is business communications. It's not like medical devices. It's, it's an important point. Like, am I making sure that that's a problem that communication or whatever we're trying to, you know, is that a problem that the room thinks is worth solving? Because if someone, if it's not the problem they think is worth solving, then that's your presentation. Your presentation is now off of your slides and you're just there to talk about the problem space until you get agreement. And if you don't, then you just saved everyone and yourself the um, going through slides for something that no one apparently thinks is valuable in the room. So I think it's a really important check early on to understand that ever agree on the challenge, right? And it doesn't have to be a long drawn out 10 slide affair. It's just make sure that like, Hey, like here's why we're in the room. Are we all in agreement? Um, you will save yourself so much trouble. It's also a good way to engage the audience early. And that, so in my mind, the reason this applies even more to exec, I mean, it applies to everybody, to yep. be clear. But the reason it applies even more to executives is once there's that little miss, that assumption has been made, the audience's mind is going to go somewhere else. And like you have so Hard. many meeting priorities, yep. your mind's going to go even faster. Am I right? That's correct. Yeah, it, it's hard to get it back on track. I mean, you've been everyone in this room has been on a presentation where like it just hung a right when you thought it was going to hang a left and it's really hard to get it back. So the more upfront, I mean, listen, the best reps by far, I mean, there's mountains of data to prove this out. The best reps by far do one thing better than the rest is pre-call prep. Like, they prepare ahead of time they treat every, they don't treat everything as just sort of like a generic approach. They try and understand who's in the room. What do they know? What, does my, has my champion briefed them? What does he brief them? I'm going to verify anyway. And then, you know, it's not like there's just magic happening on the presentation, right? There's not like, it's not like the Glen Gary situation where the closer just walks in and makes it happen. Usually they do all of the prep before the customers even in the room or on the line. We have a question from uh, Gene, and we can save this for later if you think there's another time that would be better to answer. But basically, Gene's question is, if you're selling to the C-suite, um, what's better, to have technical expertise or good business acumen? Um, I think it depends on whether you're talking to the technical part of the C-suite or not, right? Yeah. So if you come in with a heavy tech solution selling to the CRO, and their challenge is quota attainment, rep attainment, uh, attainment distribution, um, BDR ramp, inside sales ramp, productivity models, then like getting really intense on technical acumen of your integrations is probably going to miss the mark. Um, but if you come in really high level with the CIO, CTO, chief architect, then you're probably going to have a miss there as well. So 
I mean, the number one rule of presentations, I think, is there's no number one rule of presentations. <laughs> like you have to, it, everything's specific to the audience, your product, your model, et cetera. But it's a really yeah. good question. Um, I personally, I personally value business acumen because I'm the head of marketing. So as you would imagine. Cool. All right. And we've got another great question from Steve Tuck, but Steve, I see you. I'm going to save your question for a little later. All right. Keep moving. Hey, this is what we were just talking about. So I can blast through this. Um, it's really simple. The, you just look at Apple. Um, no Apple presenter speaks longer than 10 minutes at a time without someone else jumping in. And the reason why is that if you just look at people's attention spans, that it dies at 10 minutes when one person is talking. And again, we're talking about, this is a setting where everyone in the room is actually there excited, right? And that, you know, like, so they're anticipating and they still lose interest after 10 minutes. So bringing people in, like I said, bringing your SEN earlier, having someone present a slide, just the change of tone, the change of pace, the change of voice, it really goes a long way. Again, it's not that you're not capable it's that you're just trying to cross everyone up a little bit so that they, it just doesn't get into a routine that people can then start to zone out and people will zone out and you see it and you'll be in there and you're like thinking you're killing it and someone starts looking at their phone and you're like, oh, hell, like how did this happen, right? So, you know, one way to do it, and we'll talk about another trick here in a second, uh, but one way to do it is just to make sure that you get voices introed as soon as possible. That's a good tip. And and that's why you and I only talk for five minutes at a time at the most, because we're not Steve Jobs. That's right. Um, <laughs> I did wear all black today, though, just in case. Anybody it's working. Knows. Yeah, it's working. Hey, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, so this is the, no. I would say, in terms of, like, just being a good presenter, right, like, understanding your clicks is, like, especially on the phone, but you know what? It's actually live as well. Is, and what I mean by that is like when you're writing your script or your speaker's notes or if product marketing has written a script for you, um, you, you sort of need to have an idea of when, when you're going to actually transition to the next slide. And I'll tell you why. Because what happens is if you don't, you end up with a, a, a presentation that's filled with one slide presentations, right? And every slide feels like a new adventure. And it's like, I just took you through this slide and we've gone through this slide and now we're good. Now I'm going to give you a totally new slide. Um, and then oftentimes, especially for people that are winging it, we saw that 31%, like they don't even know what the next slide is. So then there's this, and I, you've all done it because I've seen everyone do, do it and I've done it before as well, where you're talking and then all of a sudden you, you click slides and you're like, oh yeah, that's a good slide. <laughs> like, it, like you can see it on their face or like, oh, I, I wasn't expecting that slide or, oh yeah. And then I, I quickly try to rapidly process what's on. Okay. And then I start and I start talking and you end up, it's like a bad cell phone connection with, with latency, like where you have this weird start stop and yeah. the, uh, it's so painful to be in the audience for one of those. So one thing I would say is um, you got to know the next slide. You got to know like w when you're wanting. Oh, so the, you got to know the next slide. You got to be prepared for people to call. And then um, the, the verbal transitions are like this. So it's like I, I have a point that I know I'm going to want to make. One way to do it, if I'm saying 2 plus 2 equals 4, I would say, so what we found is that in our research is that 2 plus 2 equals, hold on, let me, oh, I've got it. I'm back out of, I get Zoom just blocked me. All right, there we go. 4, right? So try that again. <laughs> so it's like 2 plus 2 equals, wait for it, and then you go to the next slide. And what happens is, is that you end up in a situation where people, you're, you're using the visual aids to sort of bridge the gap so that yeah. slide one goes to slide two, so slide three, and then it's not slide one, hard break, slide two, hard break, slide three, hard break. And I'll just tell you, you, you just lose the audience. So one way to do this is just sit in your friend's sales presentations. Like, and just as an audience member, you're in, you're incented to care. Like you work for the same company, and see if you can like just literally, honestly say that yeah, you had me hooked. Um, and what happens is is just stringing it all together is super helpful. But um, a quick hack here, something that I I see that people do really well. There's this whole idea of just sort of like, you know 
presentations follow a certain structure, right? Like I have visual aids or maybe not, and I stand in the front of the room or I'm on the phone or whatever it may be. And um, everyone has an expectation. Like, you know, there's a time period. There's a pre So the more you can shake that up a little bit, it, it's, it's, it's a great way to just make sure it sort of jars everyone to attention. So one of the things I always talk about is like, if you just, if you look at data points, people, uh, they just assume they're going to go left or right, especially in the U.S., um, and Europe, and then if they go point A, point uh, B, point C, then they expect them to go top to bottom. But there's really no reason that they have to unless it's like, it, you know, they're chronological, but even then. So a lot of times, just start with the middle point. Start with point C. Start with, give the thing where they're looking because they're, they're looking at your slide and they're hearing your voice. And don't let those things can be completely in sync. And what will happen is you will get everyone back to attention. So it's a good thing to do at the midway point. You're at the five-minute mark. You've got a list you want to make. And, and so we have a slide in, in um, Dialpad that's sort of like, it's say, hey, like a quick history of Dialpad. And I, I always encourage the reps, and it goes left to right. And I'm like, congratulations. Thanks to the design team for designing that. You should read it right to left. Or read it middle, two, three, one, whatever you want to do. And just setting the expectation it's a weird little mental trick, but I promise you it works. You should try it. And especially if you're face-to-face -face or if you're video and you can see their reaction, you'll see people's eyes just sort of like, they'll sort of jar their head a little bit of like, oh, we're, we're bouncing around. It's also a really good way to let the audience know that you're in control of the presentation, which goes back to confidence. So um, I think giving not like sort of, you know, not always following the script, I guess I would say is a really good mental way of get, getting people to uh, keep attention. I love this tip. It's so sneaky, but it's like, it, to me, it would send a signal. Look, the slide isn't driving me. I'm driving the slide. The slide's there so I can use it if I want to, but I'm not letting the slide boss me around. I'm not going in order just because the slide says I have to. Right. I, I mean, it, it it's just, a, it's also, yeah, it's your way. I mean, again, some of the best presentations I've ever seen are, they're on the, they're whiteboard presentations. They're people, they're, you know, and not everyone, you know, it's hard to do when you're inside sales. But if you're, if you're field sales and you're getting to present live, one of the best things you can do is just ditch the slides and go over to the whiteboard. You start writing, you're standing, you, you literally now have complete control of the room. Um, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you'll need an attorney. I've been in several long, different webinar, but like whenever you're in a room and one of the attorneys is standing and one is sitting, the person standing wins that negotiation 10 out of 10 times because they just have complete command and you're sort of in the same boat here. The more in control you appear to be, usually the more in control you are mm -hmm. um, and the people want you to be the expert, which would be what I would call a slide transition to number nine, which is my Willy Wonka quote of we're the music makers and we're the dreamers of dreams. And it's right here. The audience wants you to be the expert. So yeah, I can't stress this enough. Like it's so concerning when you're in a presentation and the person isn't giving you a lot of confidence. And I, I, I would I would think this stock that the company that I talked about that's pre IPO, it seems to be killing it. This presentation was not indicative of their success, but it was really terrible. It was really challenging. And, and to the point where I felt uncomfortable, like, is this mm. person okay? Like I'm looking at their managers, like you're just hanging this person out to dry. Like, why would you do that? Like if I, all I was doing was thinking <laughs> about all of the things that they probably didn't want me thinking about. Um, but it goes like this, like you, you, you have to tell the audience what's important, right? And, but I will tell you a common thing is if you put it on the slide, you better be ready to make it important. Um, and I'll give you a really good example. This happens a lot in like in investor presentations. So if you ever find yourself pitching VCs, what'll happen is you'll do something like, and, and it's very similar and that's sort of very similar to an executive presentation, but it'd be like bullet point one really awesome. Bullet point two, look at us. Bullet point three, awesome. And then like bullet point four will be like, and we closed our first deal in China. And you'll be like, oh, we're pretty stoked. We closed deal in China. And then next thing you know, the person across from you got their MBA in China and they know all of the players in China. And then now you're, you're completely in a conversation about the Chinese market 
when it was your fourth bullet point that you were really sort of just appending on there because you thought it was cool. And now you've lost your presentation, right? You're 15 minutes later and you don't want to tell them that your brother-in-law works for a company in China that signed <laughs> up and you have no Chinese strategy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so yeah. you have to tell them what's important, but you got to be prepared to make those things important. Um, one thing I would tell you, the number one rule of presentations, you just don't apologize. If you're starting late, don't apologize. You say, hey, we're, 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 uh, we'll get started here in five minutes. Um, you don't think things, you know, you don't think that that customer had a 70% ROI. You either know it or you get back to them with an answer. If someone asks you a question, you don't answer. Answering with, oh, I think that's right, is worse than saying, I don't know, but I'll get you an answer by Tuesday. Like, one of them makes me feel really shaky, and one of them makes me feel very solid. Um, and then you have to focus on what you want them to focus on. So if you're going to put your bullet point about the deal that you close via a family member, you better be ready to talk about it. Um, I would just suggest you take it out. It's my personal opinion. Um, hey, here we go. We can jump into the All executive right. tips unless you've got some questions. There are a couple questions here. And uh, I think there's a couple of places where we can drop them in. But before we ask you some questions, I want to ask the audience another question. So guys and gals, we've got another poll for you that we're going to launch. The question is, what's your biggest challenge when presenting to the C-suite? I know my answer. I'm going to submit. We'll give everybody three more seconds for that, and then we'll close it down and show the results. Yeah, and if we got some others, I want someone to speak up and tell me what they are because I'm curious. I have some guesses about the others. All right. All right. See those bolts. Wow, very evenly spread again, but it looks like the biggest challenges really are building a deck, yep. fielding a question, speaking confidently. Uh, if you answered other, tell us what you're talking about in the Q&A. Kate, was other. Biggest challenge is usually navigating the politics and power structures. Yes, much like life. Internally, yeah. Meredith says the biggest challenge is talking at the right level for the person in the room. Sure. It's about their business challenges. Yeah. Can I, I want to talk to building a deck real quick. Um, Let's do it. So you should demand that your product marketing teams provide you with essentially a library of um, visuals that you can then build from. Um, you shouldn't demand PowerPoint as a service. I don't think that's scalable. Um, but like you should absolutely, and I would say like this goes to the really sort of when a healthy relationship between product marketing and sales exists, what, when you're starting to build it, you see a slide that needs to be built more than once, marketing should build it for you. I say this confidently as the head of marketing. Um, if it's just a one-off constantly, like that can't, you, you just need a template for that. Yeah. But I, I hate the idea that salespeople are sort of, you know, chained to like, you know, feeling restrictive in their the visual aids that they require. So, um, you know, this might be a good time to talk to product marketing because I, I think like if you're going to present 15 slides the master deck probably has 90 to be honest like you like product marketing needs to be more involved in your sales pres set presentations in general so that they're constantly providing you all of this so that you can pick and choose it you should be checking things in and out if you're presenting a 90 deck slide then you're dead I just want everyone to know that so please stop like it doesn't work we're going to talk about that in just a second as to why. We've got a couple other challenge, uh, questions, not challenges, yep. excuse me, um, that I th are executive specific, but I don't know if we've really covered them. And we've gotten the question enough that I feel like we should talk about it now before we run out of time. So uh, who asked this? Michael, Manina, Jay Choi, both asked about prospecting tips. Yep. So like m the first touch to you, what, kinds of things let's talk about email get your attention right away yep um so i can only speak for myself but i'd like to think i'm not completely unique um i care about so i care about people that look like us so when you're when i dial pad 
um, high growth venture back company, Series D, pre IPO. Like, I, I get when I when I get an email that's about like a manufacturer. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, and you'd be surprised at how many I get <laughs> that are so just feel not relevant at all. Yeah. Um, those are so I look. The first thing I look for is like a pattern match of like you know okay well you know I so whenever people say like see how so and so did so and so and if and if the first so and so that's a very technical term you guys so and so but if the first if that's like slack i'm like i'm i'm opening your email or it's elastic or it's intercom or it's drift like companies that i think are really well you know well run interesting those are the the emails i always open or if it's timely and shout out again ad quick i didn't even know this company existed i have no shares in ad quick but we just ran a bunch of out of home in the bay area um radio billboards etc and just kudos to that it was very timely something that we were talking about it, it wasn't like a guess they they obviously saw that we were doing something and then they reached yeah. out with a good message. Those are the two things that usually get my attention. It's really hard. Like the things I like the, the sort of like general ask are really bad. I got to be honest with you. The sort of like pick your brain, like get a cup of coffee, just like things that I like, I don't like time. I have four kids and two dogs. Like I'm like all of my extra time. I'd rather be at home. Um, yeah. So, you know, Picking, getting my brain picked, which sounds sort of painful anyway, doesn't seem like a good use of time. So, yeah, I mean, my... so that, I'm not an executive, but for me too, the bar to like get a meeting with me is actually like astoundingly low. You just have to show me that you know what I do. Yeah. <laughs> so many messages I get right. are, are like trying to get me to, you know, uh, I don't know, get more leads for our sales team. It takes two seconds of research on LinkedIn to know that our sales team is one person and he's got all the relationships he needs. Yep. So it's just kind of silly. There's um, some, there's some lazy prospecting. I'm not accusing yeah. anyone on this call, um, but not there's some lazy, call. not on this call, but there's some lazy prospecting out there. So um, we had another question about kind of getting into the mind of an executive from Mary Moss. And I thought this was interesting. She said her challenge in presenting to the C-suite is other. And it's the like before and after the small talk portions, the like get to know you portions. When you see people do that well, like make a connection with you before they actually start formally presenting, what are they doing? Um, so I like, I I'm always most comfortable around people that are the most comfortable. Mm-hmm. So when someone comes in like I like, I'll give you a good tip. This is good for interviews as well. Like whenever someone says, "Do you want to?" Hey, can we? Would you like a drink? And I'm talking water, coffee, whatever. But hell, we can have anything. The answer to that question is yes. I'd love some water. I'd love some coffee. Like I, and I'll tell you why. Like one, it just like one get someone else working for you. I think that's never a bad move. And two is like you're just sort of like you seem more comfortable. Like you're like yeah. yeah. Great. Where's the kitchen? It'd be great. Oh, I would love some water. Oh, I'd love some coffee. Like you immediately seem like you're, you know, it's like, oh no, I'm fine. Like, oh no, I'm fine. Feels like we have this giant wall between us. Um, yeah. But if you make me walk to the kitchen to get you a LaCroix of which we have every flavor, um, I've suddenly, one, we're walking and talking and two, you just seem comfortable to me. So that's my pro tip. Always say yes. Always say yes that's to the great. lobster always say yes to the LaCroix. Oh, there it is. There's a couple of really good executive tips. All right. And those weren't even prepared. Let's hear yeah. what you prepared. Those, those, but they're, all, they're also true. All right. So I'll, <laughs> I'll jump in here. Um, let me, um, oh, sorry. Zoom and I have a love-hate relationship. So this is a really good one. I think quality, so when you get to the executive level, so usually you've had a meeting beforehand or um or maybe you've just gone straight up and they've taken your meeting, the quality, your quality of the presentation should be a surprise. Like, Hey, like this is so much better than I was expecting, but the content shouldn't be, this isn't a really good idea to try out your new angle. Um, I would say with executives, you want to sort of give them what they, what they thought they were getting, um, which is, um, Oh, Sorry. I got a little bit of a lag there. Apologize. Never uh, apologize. Yeah, my bad. Understand expectations. Are we all on the same slide? Yeah. Yep. Looking good. Good. 
All right, sweet. Um, so you want to get alignment ahead of time, and then you want to get alignment again, and then you want to make sure you deliver on that. So if, if the expectation is that you're going to present on a very specific part of a solution and that you have customers relevant to this person's audience, you need to show up with that. Um, present it better, be more compelling, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not a good time to come out of left field. Um, time is just such a huge, it, and I hate to say it, like, cause um, the executives are humans too. But the reality is, is like the being an executive is not a better job. It is a different job. And it usually just means that your calendar is full all the time. So anytime you're in a meeting, the bar is high in terms of time management. Like you're like, mm -hmm. Hey, I'm giving you 30 minutes. Please make good use of those 30 minutes. And the biggest way to screw that up is to not present what the person thought they were getting. So I would just, you know, in this particular case, I would give them what they want. You can read right to left. You can read bottoms up. You can stand in the back of the room. You can stand in the front of the room. You can have multiple people talking. Those are all good. But you want to make sure that what they were expecting is what they're going to get. Um, I'll jump really. This gets into time management and just time in general. Um, Tom Petty had a great quote. Don't bore us. Get to the chorus. Um, I always love that one. I always also call it just get to the effing point. Um, the like time isn't on your side. Um, don't bury the lead. Like just, you know, I would lead with your point and I would lead again, lead with the problem. Here's why we're here. Do you like, do you know, do we care? Let's get on with it. Um, if you make it through your slides, it's a friggin' miracle. Like, because if you make it through your slides in an executive presentation, oftentimes that means they're not engaged. Yeah. So I, I was not a, go ahead. A big problem with that. That I would create this narrative with the deck and it would show all my reasoning leading up to a great point at the end. Um and eventually my <laughs> manager who the same manager who gave me bad advice for creating a deck. <laughs> right. She had a piece of good advice for me. Um which was just like make your point and then let them ask questions about how you got there. Or let them ask questions to expand yep. on your reasoning or like how it would work. You don't have to yep. explain it all before you make the point. Yep. It, it, you know, in speech giving, the, the adage is like, tell them what you're going to say, tell them what you're saying, and tell them what you said. Yeah. And um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Like you, you, I mean, you really, it's like you want to stand up and say, like, here's why we're here. This is what we're going to, and this is better than just agenda setting. I mean, it's really driving the point home. And then deliver. And it's a situation where less is always going to be more um, slides, I would use them. This is not the time to pull out your 50 slide deck. And I would be very like the, the more you can engage again, like if you're just presenting and everyone is sitting on the, it's quietly on the other side, you've probably lost. Yeah. Um, the final thanks for sticking with us. And I somehow ended up with a bunch of random movie quotes. Um, <clears throat> but this one would be the final scene in eight mile, which let's be honest, is like the godfather of our generation, Rebecca. Um, thank you. The, um, so this comes to response blocking. Um, I won't explain the final scene in 8 Mile. I just assume you've seen it. But the point is, is that you anticipate all of the negative things that are going to be thought or said, and you just say them ahead of time. Right. So you prepare for any direction, you response block, you don't avoid controversy. If you know that that person doesn't think that like, hey, like this is interesting, but we can't possibly do this. It can't be done on time. You should be starting with how it gets done on time. If you're like we like that's great, but that's for a bigger company then you should be starting of why it's not for just big companies or that's for small companies. You better start with and start with like, hey, there's a general misconception oftentimes that, that you know, we're an SMB play, but that what dial pad. Well, let me explain to you that Motorola uses us with, you know, 20,000 lines or Syngenta. You, you know what I mean? Like, just start right there. Like, that's the first point to make. Don't mess around. Um, and, and so I would go into it and you almost want to reverse your presentation. It's sort of like, what do I, where does this thing go sideways? Like, what are the negative things that person's thinking? And oftentimes they don't say them, right? Like life is easy when everyone just speaks up and objects. More times what this looks like is that people are oftentimes just sitting there disengaged. So you need to try and think like, put this is the empathy conversation of like, 
what, what would they be thinking? And if you have a champion internally, oftentimes that's how you end up in these executive meetings. That's the questions you want to ask. The questions are like, what, what are the pitfalls? What are the, where does this thing go sideways? And there, there's your first two slides. And honestly, so you, might be your entire presentation. Would you even transparently bring this up as like, here's where most people, here's like one question most people have when I show them the product. And almost bring it up, like say, like here, here's an objection. Here yep. you go. I'm going to handle it before you even have it. Hundred percent. I mean, if you bring up the objection and resolve it, th there's like a thing in like customer support, customer service, and if you look at brand loyalty, um, the consumers are most happy with brands not that in brands where they never had a problem and never had a problem. They're actually most happy with brands where they had a problem and that problem was resolved. Yeah. So. So like that's what builds like that's what builds a connection. So the same thing applies here. Like yeah, start with the objection and handle the objection. And now you have someone that's leaning into the presentation instead of waiting or leaning out of it. Um, and by the way, this is for any any meeting. But a lot of times, by the time you get to the executive, they're the go no go. Like so, they're and their job oftentimes is risk, right? So if it, if it's if there's a risk and it smells risky it's dead. Right. Yep. And so you have to resolve that early. And I'm telling you, like, you should start, you, you should start like treating some of these presentations, like the last scene in eight mile and see what happens. I think you'd be pleasantly surprised. I love that tip. And this is actually like, this one works. Like I use it on my wife. <laughs> As you should. <laughs> I use it, you know, at work, I use it with employees. It just works because it helps make, you're talking about the same things. It shows them that you understand their concerns before they give voice to them. And it's just a better way to communicate. And you're not, you're not scared. Hiding. That's right. You're not hiding anything. No, yeah. what, it's confidence. I mean, you start with, you start with the objection and you handle it. You look, go all the way back to slide one and you look like someone who's confident and that own is the dreamer of dreams and owns the presentation. And it's just told everyone what's going to happen and what's important. And that is, um, that's going to result in a much better presentation for everyone, but also mostly when you get to the C-suite. And there it is. With uh, two minutes left, we've come full circle. The undercurrent of this whole talk is you have to be confident. Hopefully, you've all picked up some specific tips, things to practice, things to do, not do, that can help you be more confident. If you weren't taking notes, we're going to send the deck out to you, so you'll have that to look at. Um, yeah, if you have a question, we can try to squeeze it in in a minute or two. And it looks like we've answered everybody's questions. Um, people, if you have more and uh, you want to ask Dialpad or Keith questions, Keith, where can they find you? Yeah, Keith at Dialpad.com. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, you can also find me around LinkedIn and whatever. And, right. you know, I fully expect everyone in here that sells marketing automation, anything to start pitching me. I'm going to start judging you immediately on the quality of the communication. Um, but yeah, Keith at Dalpad, K-E-I-T-H. I'm happy to, um, I'm, I'm seriously happy to answer questions. I appreciate the time. Check out Dalpad.com, Dalpad Cell. And um, Colin, this was great. I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, super invaluable tips. And I learned a lot. I think the audience loved it. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I hope to see you on another Sales Hacker webinar very soon. We'll talk to everybody then. Bye-bye. Thanks, y'all.